So what did we discuss in our last lecture? So we started understanding how to do uh, control in the model free setting, right? How to find pi star when we do not know the uh, dynamics of the MDP, right? So we have seen that uh, uh, like in the policy uh, iteration algorithm, you can just replace the you had a policy question algorithm like this which was we had some policy iteration algorithm like this in this we made uh two changes right so what was the first change we made we replace the policy evaluation uh, previously we were doing policy evaluation in an iterative fashion right using the bell bellman expectation equation in the actual policy equation algorithm when we know the model so we replace this p with uh, something like monte carlo in theory right we can use monte carlo to estimate v pi naught but uh, if we just estimate v pi naught using monte carlo then we'll have an issue in policy improvement, right? Because policy improvement uh, using V pi naught requires the model parameters, right? So what is policy improvement? Uh, your arg maps over A Q pi naught of S comma A, right? So if you have only V pi naught, uh, if you have to write this in terms of V pi naught, we need uh, model parameters, right? Which we do not have. So we don't have these two uh, model parameters. So instead of estimating uh, V pi naught, we decided that uh, we'll estimate Q pi naught so that we can directly use uh, this equation. So that is one thing, like we replace this with Monte Carlo, then we, instead of estimating this, we used, we estimated Q pi naught. That is one change we did. And then uh, in the policy improvement also, we made some changes, right? What was that? Yeah. So if you know, let's say you are doing Monte Carlo, uh, you uh, are starting with some state S comma A. And after that, if you are following some deterministic policy pi, so if you encounter some other state S, S dash, let's say, uh, the action that you will take will be pi of S dash. So you will always see... Uh, like whenever there is some other state, you will only see S dash comma pi of S dash or S double dash comma pi of S double dash. So the same action, state action pairs will come. Like similar, like whenever there is S dash, you'll only see pi of S dash. You won't get other actions when you are following policy pi, right? If you want to do policy improvement, you should have a good estimate of uh, Q pi not of S comma A for all S comma A's. Right, so to get good samples for all possible S comma A pairs, uh, instead of whenever you visit some state S dash, instead of always playing pi of S dash, if uh, this uh, has some variation, is so when you visit S dash, instead of always using pi of S dash, maybe you use some other actions also, then you get uh, more samples, right? So if you have some other A here, then if you look at the return from that place you will get a sample of Q of S dash comma A. So to just have more exploration here so that you get different types of samples, we moved from a deterministic policy to a stochastic policy. No, we are always following policy pi, right? No. I mean, uh, if it's not a deterministic policy, other actions are like if it's a if it's no, if it's a stochastic policy, there is nothing called pi of s dash, right? You only have pi of a given s dash with different probabilities. Like if there are four actions, uh, all four actions will have some probabilities. The note the notation pi of s dash doesn't it itself is uh, uh, like the note. 
Based on pi of s dash itself is meaningless when you have a uh, stochastic policy, right? Pi of s dash is meaningful only when uh, you have a deterministic policy, right? Because it's a mapping from uh, state space to action space when it's a deterministic policy. But if it's a stochastic policy, it's not a function from state to action, right? It's a function, uh, it's for any given s, you just give the probabilities for all the possible states, like for all possible actions. So your pi of your pi itself will have different actions which are possible. Depending on the probability, you'll choose one of the action. So you although you follow the same policy pi, you keep seeing different state action pairs. So it's not that whenever you see status, you'll always see a one or sometimes you'll see a one, sometimes you'll see a two. Because uh, the pi is a random policy. So to have that exploration in our uh, uh, approach, uh, we move from uh, improving the policy greedily to improving the policy in an epsilon greedy fashion so that uh, there is some uh, stochasticity in our policy. Right? Uh, so, so that's another change which we did. Instead of going from, uh, instead of improving. Greedily, we move to epsilon greedy policy improvement. Okay. Uh, we also uh, mentioned that uh, whenever you do epsilon greedy policy improvement, uh, it is guaranteed that the new policy is better than the previous policy. So you have this uh, pi one, which is obtained as epsilon greedy of pi naught, let's say. And then after that, you again find pi 2, which is again epsilon greedy over pi 1. Then uh, we can say that v pi 2 is greater than or equal to v pi 1. Okay. So this is uh, the policy improvement theorem applies even when we are dealing with uh, epsilon greedy improvements instead of just greedy improvements. Okay. So this is uh, something which we have seen. and. Then after that, we have also seen how to do TD control. Like instead of in the same manner, we again use epsilon greedy improvements. Instead of using uh, Monte Carlo for our uh, prediction, we for our policy evaluation, we just do uh, TD method. We have seen that there is an algorithm called SARSA, uh, which uh, it's just a TD update rule for uh, Q pi. Like if you want to predict Q pi using TD method. Uh, Oh, we will use this algorithm called SASA. Okay. And if you remember in Monte Carlo, we were updating, we are improving the policy after every episode. So you just do policy evaluation for one episode and then you epsilon greedily improve that policy. In the TD method, uh, if you remember, we were improving the policy after every interaction with the environment, after every step of interaction. We are not even waiting for one episode. Okay. So this is roughly what uh, we have covered in the last lecture. Okay, so coming to today's lecture, uh, what we'll do is uh, like, uh, so like Monte Carlo control using epsilon greedy policy improvement and then we looked at the td control pulsar okay uh, in today's lecture what we'll see is uh, we'll see uh, a few other ways of dealing with uh, this problem of uh, less exploration in the uh, greedy policy so there are some methods called uh, like uh, half policy methods, which we'll see today's lecture. So whatever we have seen in the previous lectures, this Monte Carlo control uh, method and the TD SARSA method, which we have seen, those are called on policy methods. Uh, we'll see something called off policy methods in today's lecture. We'll I'll explain you what do we mean by on policy and off policy, and then. Uh, we look at the Monte Carlo of policy version and a TD of policy version also. The TD of policy version is called Q learning.
okay so this is what we will cover like we will cover off policy methods in that we will also discuss monte carlo off policy methods and td off policy methods and the td off policy method uh, one of one such method is called the q learning algorithm which is uh, popular rl algorithm okay and whatever we discuss in the last class are called on policy methods okay <laughs> mm, so so let's uh, look at this off what do we mean by off policy method so let's say you have a policy pi which you want to uh, for which you want to estimate uh, let's say v pi you have some policy pi and you want to predict what is uh, v pi okay so uh, previously uh, in the monte carlo method what we were doing we were starting with some state let's say some status and we are taking actions according to pi and interacting with the environment and generating our episode right to start with some status and then uh, take action a according to pi and you get some reward and you get some new state and you again take action according to pi and you continue till you reach an end of the episode and one uh, like the returns in this uh, episode will be giving us sample estimates of our vpi right so this is the uh, general on policy method which you have seen so here this is called on policy method uh, like the previous this is what we have seen before right so this is called on policy method because what is that you want to estimate here you want to estimate about something about pi so pi is what is called as the target policy like target policy means the policy uh, uh, like uh, the policy of interest which you are want to learn about like we want to learn about what is how good the policy pi is right we want to understand what is v pi so this is the target uh, that you have you have some policy pi which is whose value you want to estimate so this is called target policy because this is the policy of interest and how you are interacting with the environment uh, using what policy you are interacting with the environment you are interacting with the environment also using the same policy pi right so uh, like how you what policy you you use to interact with the environment is called behavioral policy how you are behaving okay so there are two terminologies one is called target policy and another thing is called behavior policy maybe i'll use b for this so target policy means uh, the policy uh, which you are interested in like the policy which you want to learn about so you want to you have you want to learn about the policy pi so our target policy is pi now uh, how you want to interact with the environment is what is called the behavioral policy okay so like in some cases uh, we might not we might want to learn about a particular policy pi but uh, maybe it's not uh, ideally good to behave according to pi maybe let's say you want to understand uh, let's say in you are training some autonomous vehicle car autonomous car or something maybe you want to understand what happens if i press some button which i should not press like maybe you want to uh, like you are going in a lane and maybe if you uh, if there is a if you turn left maybe you will fall down of the road but that's what you want to understand that is your pi let's say if you turn left what will happen that's what you want to understand maybe you are very likely to have a negative result if you turn left right so you want to learn about pi but you don't want to behave according to pi okay but without behaving according to pi can i learn about pi okay that is what is called off policy method you don't want to actually try that policy as it is but you want to learn about that policy okay 
so sometimes it might be like as i mentioned it might be of interest to not follow that actual policy maybe it's very costly to follow that policy uh, like practically it might be very costly or uh, you don't want to follow that policy but you want to learn about that policy so can we follow some other policy b that is you want to interact with the environment with some other policy b but still learn about the, the value of policy 5 okay so that is a motivation one uh, way to think about what are top policy methods either have to come friend or talk loud Uh, we'll discuss that. Uh, we'll discuss that. Uh, but at a high level, you understood what is the difference, right? You are behaving according to some other policy, but you want to learn about uh, the target policy. Okay. So, like, have you heard about this technique called important sampling? Any of you heard about important sampling? So, this is a standard technique in uh, probability uh, theory. Okay. So but let's say uh, let uh, let's look at this example. Let's say uh, you want to estimate uh, you have some uh, random variable h, and you want to find uh, expected f of x. F is some function. Maybe let's say f of x is x square or log x or some function of a random variable h, and you want to find uh, the expected value of x uh, when uh, You want to find the expected value of h where let's say h is distributed according to some probability distribution p okay so one uh, one way to estimate this is you take multiple samples uh, from the distribution p uh, let's say i'll call them uh, uh, like let's say you take multiple samples h1 h2 so on some it's in all sampled from p like you take multiple uh, let's say independent samples from the distribution p and you just write it as uh, right this is how we generally do the estimation right so you want to estimate what is f of expected f of x you just take uh, let's say some n samples for some large n you just take n samples of from the probability distribution p and you just take the average of all of them so this is one uh, this is a natural uh, way of doing it now let's say you don't have a way to sample from uh, the distribution p maybe p is some complicated distribution maybe sampling from sampling from the distribution is a little difficult and then uh, what uh, we want to do is we want to sam take samples from some other distribution but we want to estimate this quantity but we want to estimate this quantity but we don't want to take samples from p we'll take samples from some other distribution okay so what we can do is uh, we can just use this small trick what is the definition of uh, expected uh, this expectation the set of all uh, sum over all possible h f of h into uh, p of x right so this let's say i want to sample using some other distribution q what can i do uh, i'll just use this tree i'll just multiply and divide by q and what i'll do i'll just can we write it as an expectation of some function into q like like can we write it as an expectation in terms of q Q where I'll just uh, so this Q is not uh, our Q function. This is some other distribution. Okay, so this is uh, expected value of what can I write inside f of x into p of x by q of x, right? And so how now I am taking the samples according to uh, Q, but uh, I am just making some small uh, correction to my F. Previously, I was just taking samples from 
p and just taking f of x there and taking average over all f of x is that i get now if i want to uh, do that uh, let's what will i do i'll just instead of uh, taking some averages over f of x i'll add this correction term like some factor which i'll multiply which is uh, the correction which i am giving so if uh, now i can estimate it like this right 1 by n uh, sigma equal to 1 to n f of xi into p of xi by q of xi where xi comma xi sir sampled according to q right so this technique is called uh, importance sampling where uh, you are sampling from some other distribution but uh, you know what is your target distribution and what is the distribution which you are sampling you have the information about that then you just add this correction okay Yeah, we have to ensure that uh, the Q of X uh, uh, has uh, uh, support of Q of X is larger than the support of Q of X. And also that Q of X should not be zero when P of X is non-zero. No, you might know what P of X is, but getting sample from that may be difficult. Maybe P of X is some complicated, some expression which you have. So let's say you have a method, you have some, you have already written some program which will sample uniform distribution, like which will sample some uniform, you have some MATLAB program which will sample uniform distribution, okay, which will sample a uniform random variable. Now you are asked to take expectation with uh, some other uh, complicated distribution, maybe a beta distribution or some uh, other Gaussian distribution. You don't have a program which will sample Gaussian distribution. Now, but you know the formula for Gaussian distribution. So you just plug in this, you will get the answer. Because your program will generate these exercise according to uniform distribution. But you can get an expectation with respect to Gaussian distribution if you want. Because you just need to know the formula of Gaussian distribution. You don't need to have a program which generates a Gaussian random variable. Okay. So this technique is called important sampling. I think here you are giving weights to sample like uh, although you are generating xs according to although you are generating xs according to q that xs might not be uh, a, like if you generate uh, that xs might not might occur more uh, in q than p right maybe p has very little probability for this particular x but q might be generating this more frequently so you don't want to uh, overestimate right Right. So you are just giving a correction, like P by Q. So that's called the importance sampling because uh, in uh, although you might uh, in uniform distribution you are giving equal importance to every sample, but in Gaussian distribution maybe you are giving more weightage to the samples around the mean, right? So this correction will take care of that effect. Okay, so if there is a tail, uh, if you are if you are getting a sample which is far from the mean in the Gaussian distribution, then you don't want to give too much weight for it because it's a corner case for you. So the p of x, this value will uh, this this numerator value will be very less, right? Because in a Gaussian distribution, if a sample comes which is towards the tail, then the p will be low, although the q is same. So it will take care of the defect. So you are just um, uh, weighting the samples based on the importance, based on your uh, distribution of interest. So now we'll just see what is called off policy Monte Carlo. Like this is essentially the trick. Uh, although this will this might not help when we have 
one of the policy is deterministic maybe but at least uh, uh, let, let's consider two policies uh, So here uh, in the Monte Carlo setting, maybe I'll treat my H cells uh, like here H is a random variable, right? One like there, let me treat one sequence, one episode as one H. Okay. So if you behave according to pi, you'll get some kind of episodes. If you be behave according to some other behavioral policy P, you'll get different kinds of episodes. So I'll denote one uh, realization of that random variable as one episode. Okay. So when I behave according to uh like so on so this is one uh, full episode now if you behave according to pi there will be some probability of seeing this episode right if you behave according to some other policy b maybe there is a different probability of seeing this episode right Okay, so what is the probability of uh, seeing this episode if you behave according to policy pi? And this is this is what I'll take as my x, and my f of x I'll take as gt. Gt is f of x. So what will be my uh, f of x here? It will be just uh, gamma power k minus one r t plus k, right? So So this is my GT, right? Which is a function of my uh, episode, right? So now, uh, what is my? So if I want to use, uh, uh, so I'll take pi as my target policy, like the policy of interest, and maybe I'll take mu as my behavioral policy. Okay, so what is that I'm interested in? I'm interested in V pi of S. Uh, v pi of S can be written as what? Uh, expected where the episodes are taken according to pi. Uh, expected f of x given S t equal to S. Right? This is V pi of S, right? And my episodes are being sampled according to pi. Uh, that is, I'm behaving like my episodes are being sampled according to pi, and f of x is the gt uh, given uh, s t equal to s. So, if I use important sampling here, what will I get? I want to behave according to mu instead of pi. So, what should I write here? f of x into probability of uh, x. Probability of x uh, while following pi by probability of seeing the episode x uh, while following while following mu even s t equal to s right I can write like this right based on the previous thing which you have seen. Now, what is the probability of uh, uh, seeing it's uh, an episode it's while following pi? How can I calculate this? So now you are starting from status. Uh, what is the probability of uh, now? What is my this is my probability? This is my it's right now. We are understanding what is the uh, probability of seeing that it's. Now we are already given that we are starting from state S. Now, what is the probability that I'll take action AT? Pi of uh, AT given ST into, like this is Marco. There is Marco property, right? We'll use that Marco property. Now, now we took, uh, where is state ST? We took action AT. Then what is the probability that I'll uh, see state ST plus one? Like, what is the probability that I'll uh, see a reward RT plus one? That is nothing but, uh, like, that just depends on the reward distribution, right? Which is based on R ST, I mean, state ST 
and I am taking fraction according to AT, right? And like uh, this is a if you take this as a like it just depends on that. Uh, give, conditioned on uh, conditioned on being in state ST equal and taking action AT. What is the reward that I'll get? Depends on the dynamics of the NDP. It doesn't depend on the policy. Because once you condition on AT, there is nothing to do with the policy, right? So what is the reward that you'll get for being in state S and taking action A? It depends on the reward distribution. Dynamics of the MDP. It has nothing to do with the policy. Once you condition on AT, there is nothing that depends on the policy. Then uh, after that, uh, ST plus 1, what should I do? Here I should write it more properly. What I should write is, probability of seeing RT plus 1 given ST equal to ST comma AT. Okay. Probability that the immediate reward uh, equal to something given the action and state. Then what should I write after that? What is the probability that my next state will be ST plus 1? So what is the probability that my next state is ST plus 1 given given ST comma AT, right? So on. It will be like this, right? And then again, now, and then next term will be probability of AT plus 1 given S T plus 1, and so on, okay? Is this fine? Which one? Uh, can you repeat? Yeah. So you can you can write them as a joint distribution also if you want. Like you can write it as probability of party plus one sub ST plus one is an ST. No, it depends on uh, the assumption that you have. If you assume that the reward distribution and the next state distribution are independent, then you can write separately like this. If we if we assume that they are not independent, then we have to write it together. So here I just assume like this. So uh, as you said, if you want to be more rigorous, you have to write like this. Okay. So this is given by the model dynamics, right? MDP. It's not has. It has nothing to do with the policy. Huh? We started with ST equal to S. That's what V pi of S is, right? So here we can write S T equal to S. So maybe if you write uh, all these terms doesn't matter after we go to the next thing because we are interested in the ratio. So however we write the top, uh, the, once you write the bottom, a lot of terms will get cancelled out, the denominator. Like if you write the denominator also like this, while following mu, what will we have? Mu of uh, AT given ST into, this term will be same, right? Once you take action AT, then uh, what is the probability of seeing reward will remain the same. into pi of, sorry, not pi, mu. Mu of AT plus 1 given ST plus 1 and so on, okay? Now the ratio will contain what? If you look at this, calculating P of H is, we don't know P of H. We don't know P of H uh, while following pi. We don't know P of H or P mu of H. We don't know both these things. But we know the ratio. Because each term, each of these terms requires the model dynamics, right? Because this term will require model dynamics, this term will require model dynamics. 
but uh, the good thing is when you take the ratio whatever is dependent on the model those will get cancelled out only the remaining terms will depend only on the policies right so the ratio will just contain what so the ratio we just write it as uh, if i recall this equation 1 and this as equation 2 uh, 1 by 2 i'll just call like this like i think this is a notation used in the book uh, like rho pi by mu which is what uh, pi of at given st into pi of at plus 1 given st plus 1 so on by mu of at given st mu of at plus 1 given st plus 1 so on right when you divide the equation 1 and equation 2 uh, i am just writing this ratio as i am just denoting this ratio as, uh, as rho pi slash mu right So now, now you know what to do, right? Uh, after this, after, uh, we just need to, uh, whatever returns you get, you just multiply with this term before you're taking the average over those returns. Right? You just sample according to, you just interact with the environment according to mu. You'll get some return. F of H is the return, right, for us. You get some return GT. So you just don't take the GT as your estimate of V pi, V pi of S. You just multiply the GT with this ratio. Okay. So your V pi of S will be expected. Uh, we are sampling the episodes according to mu, uh, which will be GT. Uh, so we'll get the returns also according to mu, right? The returns will be based on the policy mu. I'm just writing it as GT mu because the returns are based on policy mu. But we should not uh, do this, right? Because we want expected. Uh, we want so we just need to multiply this with uh, rho pi slash mu. Okay. Given s t equal to s. Okay, so after every episode, you can calculate this ratio, right? Rho pi mu. Because you know what states you have encountered. You know what is your policy pi and you know what is your behavioral policy mu. You just calculate this ratio. So after every uh, return, after every episode, you get some GT. You just don't take the GT as it is. You just multiply this factor and take that as a one sample of your GT mu, GT pi. Right. So, like as I said, uh, a few advantages of using this method is uh, if you uh, if you don't if it's costly to behave according to pi, that is one motivation. Or you had already interacted with the environment with some data, like you with some policies before. You have some interaction data which is available with you. You played that game before with some other strategy or some other policy. So you have a lot of data which is available with you. Now you can make use of that data to predict about the policy of interest, right? You know that, let's say, you played ran using some random behavior, maybe some uniformly random policy. You interacted with the environment for a lot of time. So you collected some data based on that episode, which you got when you interacted with the environment with some behavioral policy mu. You store that data. So now suddenly someone asks you to predict about some policy pi. You can use that data to predict about V pi. Because you know with what interaction, with what policy you interacted before, you have collected the data and saved. So that same data can be used to predict about multiple policies. You just behave according to mu. Now if someone asks you to predict V pi 1, you just multiply that 
appropriately the ratio if someone asks to predict about pi 2 you just multiply the ratio appropriately so you can reuse the data to predict about different policies and that is one uh, so you can reuse your old uh, interaction data based on uh, this uh, off policy correction and uh, you can also make uh, your new more exploratory so that you see all kinds of uh, state action pairs like maybe if pi is not as very exploratory but you can make new more exploratory so that you see all kinds of uh, uh, states action pairs okay so those are some advantages okay. so you can make new more exploratory so that you see all kinds of state action pairs but you can just apply this correction factor Mm, but uh, I don't think uh, this will work for the deterministic policy because if pi is a deterministic policy, this correction will become zero. If you take some action uh, which is not suggested by pi, right? If you if pi is a deterministic policy, you follow some other, uh, let's say, random policy. So if you are in some status, maybe the random policy takes action A1. But according to your deterministic policy, pi may be... Uh, pi of s is equal to maybe action a2 okay then uh, what will pi of a1 given s will be pi of a1 given s will be zero right because we have a deterministic policy which will say whenever you are in status you have to take action a2 so if you try to apply this correction there you'll get zero right for that even if one uh, state uh, even in one state, you take an action which deviates from your uh, deterministic policy, that episode will not give you anything useful. Okay. Anyway, so when you have a deterministic policy, this uh, effort and sampling uh, might not help you that much, but if you have some other policy, which is not as exploratory as you want, then you can make new more exploratory. Okay, that is one thing. And you can reuse the old data to predict about multiple policies. That is also an advantage. So advantages are uh, uh, reuse old data and we can make new more exploratory. Okay. So let's say you want you just predicted about uh, v pi, and then uh, you are asked to predict what is v v pi two. Let's say some other policy. Then uh, one way is interact according to pi two, and then generate some episodes and predict about pi 2. The other way is you have the data which is already generated according to pi 1, right? So now you can uh, reuse the data of pi 1. You have some returns. You just apply these corrections to those returns based on pi 1 and pi 2. And you... Yeah, you can use the previous interaction episodes which is not according to your for target policy but some other policy. But you should know with what policy you got that data to apply this correction. If I just give you some data without telling what policy gave that data, then you cannot do this. So let's say uh, your uh, target policy pi, which you want to predict about, is some, let's say, an epsilon DT policy where epsilon is, let's say, 10 power minus 3. So let's say it's a, almost a deterministic policy, right? Epsilon equal to 10 power minus 3 means it's almost a deterministic policy. So you won't have much, uh, most of the times it will predict, it will be taking actions uh, which is deterministic. Only with some small epsilon, it is taking other actions. So, but it's a stochastic policy. Now you just take new to be, let's say, uniformly random policy. So which is more exploratory in the sense that it explores all other actions more more. Now you can predict about your first epsilon gd policy using this uh, uniformly random policy. Right? Right? Uh, that's fine. And so, so you can make new uh, to explore more without affecting what you want. 
okay so this is about uh, uh, how we can do off policy methods in uh, monte carlo now i'll also talk about how we can do to use off policy in td okay I think uh, this is one of the most important topics. So if there is only one topic which you want to learn in RL, maybe this is a topic, Q-learning, which is uh, the popular algorithm. So, uh, like Q-learning is, uh, like it's very easy to understand. So, we have, uh, how did we derive Sarsa algorithm? Do you remember? We looked at uh, Bellman expectation equation and we just wrote the sample version of that, right? That's how we derived uh, our TD Sarsa method. So, similarly, you just take uh, the value iteration, uh, like uh, Bellman optimality equation. You just take the Bellman optimality equation, which talks about uh, V star. Right, Bellman expectation equation talks about V pi, right, for a given policy pi. So Bellman optimality equation is about uh, finding optimal value function, right? You just take optimal value function and write the sample version of that. Then you'll get uh, the Q learning update tool. Okay. So what is uh, Bellman uh, optimality tool? Do you remember what is the Bellman optimality condition? I think it mainly uh, starts with this, right? V star of S uh, is nothing but if you know Q star of S comma A, how can you find V star of S? Match over A, right? Uh, if you do org match over A, you will get pi star. And so this is, if you just expand, uh, properly, you will get V star in terms of V star. You just write Q star also in terms of V star in the right side. Then you will get uh, uh, V star in terms of V star. Right? But in the, like, as, as we have been seeing in the model free setting, we are more interested in Q star rather than V star, right? Because uh, if you know Q star, you don't need to know the model parameters to find pi star. Right? In the policy improvement we have just seen, right? I think I erased it. The policy improvement, uh, if you know Q star, you don't need the model parameters because you just take argmats over A, Q of S comma A. So if you want to write uh, Q star in terms of uh, uh, Q star, L, like we want to write Q star in terms of Q star, okay? So what is Q star of S comma A equal to? RSA, like uh, for being in status and taking action A plus gamma times sigma s dash uh, p uh, ss dash a into what should i write v star of s dash right so this is q star right the immediate reward plus uh, the return from the rear the expected return from the next state mm -hmm. and now can i I'll just use this here, okay? So that will give me Q star in terms of Q star. Right. I just substituted what is V star, okay? <coughs> so 
so i have used a dash so that we don't get confused with a okay a dash is just a running variable isn't it? Yeah. so now uh, in the q learning what we'll just use is like what is the value iteration algorithm you just uh, use this iterative you just use some of the fixed point algorithm for this right this is q in terms of q q star in terms of q star you just start with some arbitrary uh, q and you keep applying this recursively until uh, q converges to q star right you just uh, start with some arbitrary q not of s comma a and you just find q1 of s comma a using this update rule and you keep repeatedly applying qk plus one in terms of qk then you'll get your uh, uh, it will converge to q star right and just to write it properly like you start with some arbitrary q naught you compute your qk of s comma a like this right uh, like as k tends to infinity q k tends to q star right this is the standard trick which we have been doing right uh, we just do iteratively we just apply the bellman that function iteratively till we converge to q star right so now uh, this based on this expression uh, instead of doing policy iteration, we'll like this is like value iteration, right? Instead of doing on V star, we are doing on Q star. That's the only difference. Uh, so, in Q learning, what we'll do is we'll just get inspired from this and write the model free version of this update. That's all. Like how we have seen uh, based on Bellman expectation, we have written V new equal to V old. Uh, we had the standard update rule, right? Where we just uh, predicted. We just wrote the sample version just like that we'll write the sample version for this that will give us a q learning so q new of uh, some state st at will be what what is the standard template q old of st at plus uh, alpha times some uh, estimate minus uh, Q old of STAT, right? This is our standard template. Inside this, uh, this is our, uh, uh, this is what we want to write there. We'll just write it, uh, the sample version of that, okay? So, which will be what? RT plus one, because you took action, uh, you took action A, AT in state ST and uh, expected reward it will be we are replacing the expected reward with the sample reward which is rt plus one plus gamma times um, now uh, this term is an expectation over all possible s dashes right so as usual we'll just take uh, st plus one as one sample of this s dash right the environment will give us the st plus one for acting according to at in state st so instead of uh, like this is like expected expectation over s, uh, s dash so we'll just take one sample and substitute what maths over a dash uh, q old of st plus one comma a dash okay So this is inspired from this. Okay. Uh, if you have understood how we have derived SARSA or the uh, TD for VPI, which we have done before, we did in the same fashion, right? 
we just first wrote the bellman expectation equation and we just wrote the sample version of that so instead of rsa we are using rt plus one and uh, uh, that's an expectation over s uh, uh, nest possible states instead of using all possible states we are just taking one sample s dash which is given by the environment uh, st plus one and we are just substituting that okay So this is the update rule for uh, uh, Q learning. Okay. So if you keep repeatedly uh, applying this equation, uh, you will converge to Q star at some point. And the main uh, one important thing that you have to uh, keep in mind is uh, you have to uh, make sure that uh, you are updating all Kinds of s comma s because here you are saying your st you start with some state s and take action a then you know what to update so how are you going to take at plus one like you you have to keep interacting right you have to keep applying this equation again and again right so now let's say you started with some arbitrary state s s not and you took some arbitrary action in not. Then you apply this equation once. Uh, the environment will give you st plus one. Like you started with s not a not, maybe the environment will give you s one. Now what will be your a one? Huh? Otherwise, after one step, what will you do? Like you okay, you started with s. Uh, what I mean is, let's say. You started with some state S not. Uh, maybe you started with some arbitrary state S not and A not equal to A. And the environment will give you R1 and it will give you S1. Okay. Now, after that, uh, this is enough to update your equation, right? You just need S not, uh, like ST, AT, RT plus 1 and ST plus 1. So you finish your update. Then what will you do after that? So that will again lead you to that problem. It's a deterministic policy, right? Arg maps over A is a deterministic policy, right? Arg maps over A, Q old of S comma A. So again, the same problem will come. There won't be, you won't be updating all possible S's and A's. Because you are only updating whatever is given by your current Q. Okay. So for this algorithm to work in uh, the, in the, let's say when you have the model, if you're doing the value iteration, uh, you would have, what we'd have done, we'd have done synchronous update, right? For all possible S comma A's, we'd have updated once. QK plus one of S comma A. We had QK of S comma A for all S comma A. Then what we'll do, we'll find QK plus one of S comma A for all S comma A. So we'll update that equation for all possible S comma A ones, and then we get QK plus one. So that's the synchronous way of doing. Then we also discuss about asynchronous DP, right? What is that? Instead of updating all possible S comma A, you just update some S comma A. So, but uh, you have to ensure that uh, you are updating all possible S comma A's. If you keep only updating some act state action pairs, then you might not converge, right? If you don't even update, uh, if, let's say you some for some state action pair, you don't even update at all. Then you'll whatever you started with initial estimate of Q that will remain there, right? Let's say you started with all uh, initialized Q of S comma A to hundred for uh, all S comma A's. You have to start somewhere, right? Maybe you take uh, your Q naught of S comma A for all S comma A to be hundred. Let's say you don't encounter, you never update some particular state S comma A. Then that hundred will remain there forever, right? So you have to ensure that all possible pairs are updated once in a while, right? So that, otherwise it's very clear that it will not converge to Q star, right? Because if you don't update at all, you'll stay in the initial distribution, initial estimate itself. So for this algorithm to converge to Q star, the one of the important requirements is that whatever states and actions you are updating, uh, you have to ensure that every state action pair is updated infinitely often. 
So let's say you continue, keep continuing this forever. Every state action pair should keep coming again and again. It's not like after some point, I'll never update some particular state as come in. Then that will become stale there. It will not improve after that. So the condition that is required is uh, uh, you have to keep updating every possible SMA infinitely. At least once in a while, you have to keep updating. It's not say I'll, from now I'll never update. Okay. So for example, uh, epsilon VD with respect to your current Q will ensure that. Right? So you have some current Q estimate. So you just choose your next AT as an epsilon VD uh, action from your current Q, right? Like your current Q will give you, let's say you are in some state ST plus one. Now you want to know what action you want to take. So one way is you just take this, uh, take this A as AT plus one. This is like behaving greedily, right? So this is one way of behaving. But if you behave like this, then we cannot guarantee that all possible state action pairs are updated. Uh, always. So instead of that, what we'll do is, uh, instead of doing this, we'll just call this maybe A star. And what our policy, what we'll do is we, with probability uh, epsilon, 1 minus epsilon, take AT plus 1 equal to A star. And with probability epsilon, pick any random, AT plus 1 is any random action. Yeah. So is this clear? So this is just one way of ensuring uh, that uh, all possible state action pairs are updated. Like you need not use epsilon VD, you can use even a uniformly random policy that will also ensure that all state action pairs are updated often. Okay. <clears throat> but uh, one uh, one good thing about using epsilon VD is uh, it will just ensure that you are updating whatever state action pairs are of, like your, you have some policy, right? You believe that Q is a good estimate of your uh, Q star, right? As after some time Q star is closely approximated by Q. So you are updating state action pairs which matter to you more. Okay. Because you are being epsilon did with respect to Q star. So you are updating those state action pairs which you are most frequently encountering or which are of more interest to you, okay? So on the main requirement is all state action pairs should be updated, uh, continue to get, continue to get updated. So even a uniformly random policy will work. It will ensure that you just keep behaving according to a uniform random policy and whatever action, state action pairs you are encountering, you just keep updating that uh, those state action pairs according to that equation. Okay, so this is called off policy because you are learning about the greedy policy, right? Because uh, you are learning about Q star, right? You are learning about Q pi star. That's what we are trying to learn, right? We are uh, trying to learn what is Q pi star. That is our target policy, but we are behaving according to some other policy, like a uniform random policy or an epsilon greedy policy, etc. Right. Here, ultimately, what is it we are learning? We are learning Q star, Q by star. Our target is Q by star, but we are behaving according to some stochastic policy. The value Q function of pi star. Q star is Q by star, right? So what do you mean by learn about the policy? So once you know Q by star, you know what is pi star, right? Arguments over J Q by star and Q by star. So here, uh, your, your next action is based on, uh, your next AT plus one is based on uh, some exploratory behavior, but the update here we are updating the greedy according to the greedy policy. So that's why 
in the first uh, what we were doing we were using at plus one here right if you remember so that's the difference at plus one we are updating means we are learning about uh, the policy which we are behaving according we are behaving also according to epsilon zd policy we are also learning epsilon zd policy in sarsa we had some epsilon zd policy pi one in sarsa we just take action according to pi one and we learn about q pi one Hmm. In uh, Sarsa, A prime also comes from epsilon greedy. Here, A prime, here it comes from a greedy process. So these are some subtle differences, but at a high level, you understood how we got this update, right? We just take the Bellman in an optimality condition and just take the sample version of that. We get the Q learning. And one condition that is required for conversions to Q star is we want every state action phase to be updated. If you don't update some of them, then we'll become stale, we will not converse. So one way to ensure that is use some random policy for the behavior. And the good thing is here, we don't need any correction. Although we are behaving according to uh, some other policy, we don't need correction because uh, what is RT plus one here? We are not using the whole GT, right? We are using RT plus one. So what is RT plus one? Expected, uh, like, uh, the RT plus one is one sample of expected uh, RT plus one given uh, ST equal to S and AT equal to A. It has nothing to do with policy, right? RT plus, here we, are, we had RSA, right? RSA has nothing to do with the policy. So we don't need any correction here. We took, we are in status and we took action A, whatever reward we see, we are using that. So it, this term has nothing to do with the policy. So there is nothing to correct there for RT plus one. But if you are using GT, then GT will also depend on not just your immediate action. It also depends on what next action you take, right? GT will depend on AT, AT plus one, all those things. So if you take AT plus one according to some other policy, then you have to do the correction. Here you are just taking AT and uh, it doesn't matter with, like once you take AT, whatever you want, uh, this RSA, which has nothing to do with policy. It just depends on what action you took and you are using that sample correctly. Right, and that is one thing. And the other part is in this part also there is nothing. Uh, uh, so we wanted to learn about the optimal policy. So we are just using the match over there. Match over a few old of Okay, so we are just deciding what state. Action phase to update based on our uh, behavioral policy. Okay, so that's why we don't need any corrections here. Okay, but you understood why it's a off policy, right? Because we are interested in pi star, but we are behaving according to some other policy. Uh, I think the recommended behavioral policy is the epsilon gt policy with respect to our uh, current q. Okay, so. Maybe I'll show you this algorithm just for is there some class after this? So this is the algorithm. Uh, this is the image of the algorithm from the book uh, Q learning. So we are starting with some arbitrary. Uh, we are starting with some. We are starting with some arbitrary uh, Q function. Uh, and then 
we are uh, choosing a comma yes what state action pair to update uh, based on our current queue in a epsilon gd fashion this is a behavioral policy which i mentioned and then uh, we are just using this update rule uh, which we mentioned and after every step we are just uh, doing that again based on the updated queue we are choosing the next uh, state action pair okay So that's all. Uh, the queue learning algorithm is uh, this much. This is the small constant which we are using, and we have to choose some epsilon also. So these are these two are the hyperparameters. Okay. Yeah. So this is about queue learning, and Sarsa will also look somewhat similar. Uh, but it's okay. I'll. Some people are waiting, right? So I'll show the Sarsa algorithm. In 